many vital elements go into creating the ideal wrestler. He needs an ideal character, ideal entrance music, ideal quirks and mannerisms, and of course, an ideal finishing move. Take Randy Orton for instance. If you were to build a WWE superstar from the ground, forget about that, the Viper has bore the brunt of much criticism over the years, but even his biggest detractors lose their minds whenever he finds a new way to hit the RKO, especially of the sudden as a sneeze out of nowhere variety. Settling on a perfect finishing move can be quite difficult, and you'll even see wrestlers shuffle through various maneuvers in the early parts of their career, trying to find that silver bullet. WWE's had an extensive history of main event level stars who have switched finishers whether it was at the start of their run or when they found themselves at the doorstep of immortality. Wrestling has and will continue to be a work in progress for its inhabitants and finding the right calling card as part of that influx nature. For the men ahead, it's hard to imagine them doing a finisher that's different from what we most associate them with. But in this curious little trip down memory lane, we'll see what used to be their weapons of choice. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic.com and these are 10 wrestlers forgotten finishing moves. Join us! Number 10, finish out of somewhere. We begin this list with good old Randall Keith. No, I'm not going to do the song. And a further examination on just how invaluable the RKO has been to his career. It's such a simple move. Jump up, wrap your arm tight around their head and neck, and lay them out flat with a brain rattling, neck wrenching drop that turns the lights out quicker than a power outage. Not only is the move incredibly effective, but it's also very simple. The same couldn't be said for the move a fresher face Orton used in his rookie year with the WWE. WWE, the Ozone. Also known as an overdrive, the move is a complex neck breaker done using the attacker's leg to perform the twist, and the victim's arm acts as a lever. Elix Skipper used the move, calling it the play of the day, and MVP later adopted it as the playmaker. It's fairly cool looking, but the setup comes nowhere near close to matching the startling surprise that an RKO can bring. There's a reason the Ozone out of nowhere was never a viral video sensation. Number 9. Diamonds are temporary Whether he was dispatching the occupational mid-carders of the mid-90s or sending Drax back to Hollywood, Triple H has employed a common kill shot for nearly a quarter century, the pedigree. It takes a little setup before depositing the victim onto their face, but the one underhook followed by the other does a fine job of alerting the crowd that a critical move is nigh, one that very few ever kick out of. While some might assume that the game has used this move ever since his first day as a snooty aristocrat, those folks would be wrong. His original move in 1995 had the word pedigree in it, but it was the needlessly wordy pedigree pandemonium because old school WWE sure loved its alliteration. And instead of being a double underhook face buster, Helmsley used a rather gently delivered of an ace crusher or diamond cutter. Diamond Dallas Page and Randy Orton both made the move look like life-altering assaults, whereas Helmsley, as solid as his more familiar pedigree is, looked like a man trying for an elementary snapmare before slipping onto a wet floor. Number 8. Dirt Done Cheap when you think Dean Ambrose, you think unhinged and unpredictable, or maybe wacky. A sadistic maniac who revels in the misery of the enemy, tongue hanging out all the while like a panting dog. His Dirty Deeds finish, a double arm DDT with an accelerated somewhat wild drop, reasonably matches the intensity that a gung-ho sociopath would bring to a wrestling match. It's done quickly enough, and spikes the opponent right on their noggin with brute force, so it's quite effective. The original Dirty Deeds, from Ambrose's time as a shield man at arms, was also a brutal looking drop that lawn darted the victim onto the canvas, but was far less fluid and smooth. The beta version saw Ambrose headlock his opponent, then swing downward with what's essentially a backwards DDT. EC3 uses the move, calling it the one percenter. While the move can be devastating looking, it also looked awkward watching Ambrose try and coordinate his fall with his fellow wrestler, and the smoothness just wasn't there. A snap double arm DDT, however, gets the job done in less than a second and achieves the same skull cracking effect, so the sequel was definitely better. Number 7. Kevin Nash's Punch-Out There's nothing wrong with a simple powerbomb, especially when it's a heavyweight Goliath that's forcing some poor bastard to free fall from a great height. Big Daddy Cool Diesel is one of many wrestlers synonymous with a powerbomb variation, using his simple but effective jackknife to climb the WWE ladder before polishing off Bob Backlund in late 1994 to capture the Federation's top prize. The move remained Kevin Nash's go-to across several other companies, and while Big Show may have a valid reason for disliking it, it's hard 
hard to imagine him winning any other way. When Diesel first arrived in WWE, however, the powerbomb wasn't on his radar, and his signature strike was something much more basic a punch to the head. In Diesel's early months with the company, he was portrayed as an iron fisted roughneck, laying out Shawn Michaels' enemies with a black gloved hook, and even pinned the likes of Mr. Perfect and Marty Jannetty at house shows with the elementary right hand. But Nash moved on from it, leaving the knockout punch to be used as a finisher by two other men Big Show and Butterbean. Number 6. A Bank Vault of Moves The Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase was not only one of the most brilliant heels to have ever graced the ring, but he was also one of the savviest technicians and ring generals. Sometimes forgotten amid his excellence as a high society cretin was the fact that DiBiase could wrestle circles around even the finest workers of his day. His character's wealth was equaled by the man's wealth of holds and maneuvers. Before settling on the Cobra Clutch known as the Million Dollar Dream, DiBiase cycled through a plethora of potential finishing moves in the last heart of 1987. Among them, trillionaire Ted finished his foes off with a spinning toehold, a teetering back elbow off the middle rope, and even a scorpion deathlock. He also used the Cobra Clutch, but with a transition into a Russian leg sweep, a move sometimes referred to as the Million Dollar Buster that son Ted Jr. would use for a time 20 years later. However, the clutch as a simple sleeper hold sufficed, and it remained DiBiase's move up until he retired. Number 5. Keep It Simple, Sean Speaking of older wrestling footage that's weird to look at today, journey back to the early 90s, when Shawn Michaels was exploring the space of what he could do as a cocky, narcissistic heel in the WWE. What makes Shawn's matches of the time pretty odd to watch is that he did indeed use the superkick, but not as a finish. You'd have instances of him cracking somebody heel to jaw, and the victim would fall, but wouldn't be knocked out. From 1994 onward, the superkick was a living, breathing coma dispenser. In 1992 and 1993, the superkick, which wasn't yet named Sweet Chin Music, was merely the setup to Sean's finish, a pissing teardrop suplex. It's your basic back suplex, with Sean hoisting the guy with a peculiar between the legs lift. He later tried different finishes, such as a pile driver and a fisherman suplex lifted from rival Mr. Perfect, before buddy Razor Ramon just told him to use the kick as his finish, saying it was the best move in Sean's arsenal. From there, once his opponents began selling the move like death, Michaels had his perfect finishing touch. Number 4. A Better Move. Just bring it. To be fair, watching the first eight months of The Rock's career, back when he was the smiling, wild-maned Rocky Maivia that may well be Jason Jordan's actual father, so much of it feels like Dwayne Johnson playing an ironic character on Southpaw Regional Wrestling. There is almost nothing to indicate that before long, this guy would be the coolest dude on planet Earth. No people's elbow, no rock bottom, not even a wonky version of the sharpshooter, aka the Scorpion King Deathlock. Instead, Rocky Maivia polished off his foes with a shoulder breaker. Now, there's nothing to sneeze at having your shoulder broken, especially when it's caused by a 270 pound man jamming your clavicle into his knee. But as far as finishes go, that steak had absolutely no sizzle. And Rock's greatness is predicated on his ability to produce sizzle. Sure, the people's elbow is pretty silly when you think about it, but damned if his tease of that move doesn't have 20,000 fans screaming their full heads off. And as far as the rock bottom goes, it's like the RKO. It can be done quickly, and it looks cool. Number 3. Stone Cold Submission When the glass shattered, sheer anarchy awaited, because Stone Cold Steve Austin didn't have matches, he had spectacles. Blood would get spilled, chairs swung, beers drank, and most notably stunners dispensed from a goateed vending machine sporting a charitable mindset. And just when you thought the spectacle was about to die down, hey look, more stunners. It's hard to imagine Austin being involved in anything more subdued. But he was. Completely contra to his right to pro wrestling's pantheon was the understated ringmaster, a man so soft-spoken that he made Al Snow's head look like Conor McGregor. And before taking on the sit-down variant of the Ace Crusher that was a crucial puzzle piece to his general stardom, he used manager Ted DiBiase's million-dollar dream to render opponents unconscious. Take a moment now and imagine the WrestleMania X7 My Way video with Austin hitting Rock with a shoulder breaker and Rock countering with his version of the million-dollar dream. In 2019, we'd be talking about how Eric Bischoff's ego botched the WWE invasion of Monday Nitro. 
Number two, Hulk lifts up. You can blindfold me before showing me the last two minutes of any Hulk Hogan match during his glory days, somehow mute the commentary, and I'll still tell you everything that's happening. Hogan kicked out of the finish, he's shaking his head, he's exhaling with his eyes wide open, he's shaking off the punches, ooh, there's the finger point, he's punching him three times, there's the big boots, and what do you know, there's the leg drop. Here comes Real American, let's all sing together, shall we? That million dollar formula was barely deviated from, and because it was a million dollar formula, there was no reason to mess with it. But go back to when a villainous Hogan, managed by classy Freddy Blassie, tore through the undersized jobbers at the turn of the 80s, and the leg drop wasn't quite there yet. Instead, Hogan lifted his victims into a Canadian backbreaker submission, a move used by the likes of Bruno Sammartino and Jesse Ventura. Given Hogan's purported limitless strength, the move made sense, but his Superman comeback routine seemed to have far greater lasting power. Number 1. Big Dog Takes Your Bishop For simplicity and sheer brutality, it's hard to beat the rib-breaking, gut-wrenching, sense-depriving ferocity of a heavyweight wrestler lunging shoulder-first into your gut with a football-style tackle. The spear has been used to great effect by powerhouses like Goldberg, Bobby Lashley and Rhino, and of course Roman Reigns, who telegraphs his version with a hearty hoo There are flashier moves in Roman's arsenal, but as far as finishes go, there's a profound effectiveness to Reigns' balling his way into the opponent's internal organs. And that is the key to the spear. For as devastating as the move is, it's simple. There is nothing complex about it, it is what it is. The same can't be said for the move Reigns used in his developmental days. Behold, the checkmate! A basic bulldog preceded by Reigns spinning in a circle while holding the opponent by the head. It looked like a defective toy helicopter at best and wasn't suited for a man of Reigns' star potential. The checkmate was just a case of overthinking for a finishing move. It's like what Occam's Razor Ramon tells us. The simplest solution is the right one. Chico. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments down below. You can follow us on Twitter at Cultaholic. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do here at Cultaholic, you can pledge to us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And most importantly, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us.